Christ, to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good evening. Welcome to the 11 August 2014 Town of Hampton Board of Selectmen meeting. Roman 1, public comment period. <coughs> Anyone wishing to speak, please rise, state your name. <laughs> uh, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Mike Pierce, 16 Hebman Avenue, and probably not there for long, but there for a while anyway. Uh, what I'm doing is trying to clean out my garage. What that means is I've got lots of PCs for kids, and I don't have any flat screens, okay? And not enough flat screens to go around. I don't necessarily need any PCs, but I have to take, if I have to take a PC to get a flat screen, I'll do it. But I need flat screens. I'd like to ask the board if they would allow us to put a little thing on the website to entice people to give us flat screens for the kids. And that's all I have. Thank you very much, sir. Can I ask you to do that for us? Uh, this is not a deliberative process, as you know, from where you sat last year. Well, I understand, year. but I'm just saying, can you take that into consideration, please? Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Further public comment? Good evening. I'm Jay Diener. I'm here representing the Hampton Conservation Commission and the Seaport Hamptons Estuary Alliance. And I'm here to invite uh, you, the board, and uh, the rest of the residents of the town of Hampton to our second workshop in the Preparing for Climate Change in the Seabrook Hampton Estuary process. This is going to be held this Wednesday evening, August 13th, starting at 6 p.m. at the Masonic Lodge on Tide Mill Road. Um, at the first workshop, uh, we had grape representation from the towns of Hampton, Seabrook, and Hampton Falls. Town managers from Hampton and Seabrook were there. Um, representatives from the Board of Selectmen, Mr. Griffin, were there. Um, we also had representatives from the planning boards, from the conservation commissions, from the towns, from the Hampton Budget Committee. So town government as well as town residents are well represented at these meetings. Um, and we'd love to see that continue. The purpose of these meetings is to start a discussion for what we can do as towns individually as well as towns collectively to protect ourselves from the impacts of sea level rise. And the issues that were addressed at the first meeting, just to give you an idea, were uh, the, the concerns that people had were over the loss of our wetlands and the loss of our salt marsh, which are great, our greatest natural protection and barrier against the impacts of sea level rise the effects of tourism on our communities, um, the impacts of our infrastructure. Um, so there are a lot of issues that are coming to the fore in this process. The things that were brought up that the towns collectively could work on have everything, included everything from working with the state, and I know that you as a board have been doing this for quite some time, to maintain the regulatory structure that will protect our wetlands and our salt marsh, as well as maintaining the infrastructure that's owned by the state uh, down along Hampton Beach, primarily roads, bridges, drainage, et cetera, um, to working together as a group, our three communities, to formulate zoning regulations um, that will help to protect our communities against sea level rise and, and, and basically picking up on each other's knowledge and expertise so we can formulate regulations that will work for all our communities. So it's a very interesting process. It's a very involving process. Um, and I really encourage everybody to, to get involved in this process because it's for our town. I know the town manager is going to speak a little bit more about this later in his report, but I also wanted to give you a different perspective on this and, again, invite everybody to come and be a part of this process. Thank you. Thanks very much. Appreciate it, sir. Further public comment? Gary Pohl, Four Lion Street. St. Patrick's Church this weekend will have their 100th year celebration. And I think when Father Crosby, or Monsignor Crosby, decided to have this, he didn't realize that we were going to have 500 plus people at the celebration. Now, we're, I, my question to you guys, and I'll just hopefully you'll bring it up either in your new business or old business, is what are we doing as far as a safety factor? We have no crosswalks on Church Street in that area. Are we going to have a police presence, or what is your plan? And I'll wait for it. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Further public comment? Seeing none, Roman three, Roman two, announcements and community calendar. Selectman Wilson. Um, um, 
I was going to mention this later in the uh, meeting, but uh, when the chief is up. <coughs> but we are continue to receive letters from the public thanking our first responders for what they do uh, responding to emergencies in the community, especially a really nice letter from uh, Senator Preston and uh, concerning incidents with his family. And I hope that all of the residents out there, especially as we come up to budget time, uh, understand the, the value of our first responders. And it's, I didn't know you guys were going to be here, but it's not going to hurt you to hear it um, in their personal lives. So I think uh, congratulations to, to everyone who's responding and, and rescuing and helping the public. Selectman Griffin. No, I would just like to wish the uh, church a happy 100th birthday. Oh. I have a couple of things. One here is the uh, Experience Hampton is having a free concert at the Tuck Museum in Tuck Field on Saturday, August 16th from 4 to 7. It's the Brickyard Blues Band. They were here at our 375th last year, and people really liked them, so it's a free concert to come out. There will be some nonprofits having some food there. So if you want to come down from 4 to 7 and enjoy the music and grab a hot dog or something, that would be great. And uh, again, it's a free concert by the Brickyard Blues from 4 to 7. Second one is I do have the letter here from, from the Preston, so I will read that. Yeah. So it says the Hampton Firefighters, July 16th, uh, July 26, 2014. Just a note to say thank you. Twice last week we had the occasion to call the ambulance. My wife Charlotte was experiencing heart problems, and two days later my daughter Martha fell and fractured her back. Both were transported to the Exeter Hospital. Your professionalism and courtesy helped alleviate fears in both situations. The relay of vital signs from the ambulance to the emergency room alerting the staff to their conditions was impressive. Respectfully, I hope that we do not have to need, have a need for a call you folks in the near future, but if so, we know that we can depend on an early response and professional service. The citizens of Hampton are most fortunate to have the available to them in emergency situations. Yeah. Thank you on behalf of Charlotte and Martha Preston. Yeah. Yes, I would just like to uh, give condolences to the families of the three teenagers in Unity, New Hampshire, that were killed in a car accident. And just use it as a, uh, a learning experience for the youth during the summer to drive safely. And they said speed was a factor that, that caused it. Mm -hmm. And I think with the first responders here and everything, it's just crucial that people, you know, drive safely, especially the youth of the area. Thank you, sir. Roman Free, consent agenda. I'll move it. Motion by Selectman Griffin, a second? Sure. All those in favor? Unanimous. Thank you. Roman four appointments. One, Chief Silver, Fire Department, Alpha presentation of letters of merit, followed on by Department of Updated. Sir. Good evening, members of the board. Item A is an item that um, I'm particularly proud of because it uh, represents our members very well. Uh, they had been nominated for on two occasions for uh, events that occurred during 2013 and both have been recognized by the New Hampshire Fire Service Committee of Merit. One being uh, this incident that I will read and I'll tell you about the other later. On July 25, 2013 at about 8 p.m. Hampton Fire Alarm received a call reporting people caught in a heavy rip current and in severe distress in front of 75 Ocean Boulevard, approximately the area of the Harris Sea Ranch. Crews were dispatched and responded according to department procedure. The beach station crew responded directly to the waterfront. Captain William Kennedy quickly assessed the situation, established command, and ins instructed firefighters Carpentier and Jameson to don their rescue swimmer personal protective equipment. Both firefighters donned wetsuits and prepared to enter the water. The crew from Winnicott Road responded to staff and deploy Marine One. The victims were spotted from shore and the location was given by radio to Marine One. Two rescue swimmers, Carpentier and Jameson, entered the heavy surf and began making their way to the distressed swimmers now several hundred yards from safety. Command coordinated operations between the sw swimmers and the Marine unit while fire alarm notified the U.S. Coast Guard Portsmouth Station. Lieutenant Michael Brillard aboard Marine One was communicating with command and radioed when the vessel caught sight of the swimmers. 
The boat's coxswain was firefighter Gregory Smushkin, who navigated within close range of the rescue swimmers and victims. On board, firefighter Nate Denio and firefighter Jason Newman donned their protective equipment and prepared to be <coughs> deployed. During the rescue, firefighters Kyle Averill and firefighter Donald Tebow acted expertly to tend the personnel entering the water. Upon reaching the victims and rescue swimmers, firefighter Nate Denio entered the water to assist in the extrication of the victims. There were two. All hands assisted in the removal of the victims from the water. Now being a great distance from shore, all rescue swimmers also exited the water and boarded Marine One. After the rescues were effected, command notified Fire Alarm to cancel the U.S. Coast Guard's response. Firefighters Buck Frost and Matthew Clement, the crew from the ambulance, began assessing the victims as they exited Marine One. The victims were given warm blankets and towels and entered the ambulance for further evaluation. Both people rescued from the water were cold and exhausted, but refused transport to the hospital. Through excellent teamwork and a coordinated effort, Hampton Fire Rescue crews were able to rescue two victims and return to duty in just over one hour. This call placed our members directly in harm's way and had a successful outcome due to their expertise, training, and diligence. It is for this reason that the New Hampshire Fire Service Committee of Merit awards each member with this letter of merit. A couple of notable points regarding this incident. One is the time of year that this occurred. It was mid-July, and it was at a time where the state's lifeguards were off duty. You know, We are the first response for Hampton Beach um, when they're not available. The second is... The Coast Guard was notified, but the Coast Guard cannot respond in a timely enough manner to effect a rescue in Hampton. When they receive an initial call, their first call is to us. Um, we'd recently been completing a lot of in-water rescue swimmer training because it is one of the greatest hazards that does exist in our community. And it was commented by our instructor, who is uh, an instructor in surf rescue, water rescue, rescue boat operations, not just nationwide but worldwide, that the Hampton Fire Department is probably the best trained department on the East Coast. So there's certainly something that we can be proud of. With that said, I'd like to call each member up here and just award them with their letter of merit. Firefighter Kyle Averill. Please come up and shake hands with the board. Yes. Lieutenant Mike Brother. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Good job. Firefighter Jed Carpentier. Thank you, sir. You know we get excited about you. Good job. Thank you. Good job, Lieutenant. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you, sir. Firefighter Matt Clement. <laughs> Jed, thank you. Congratulations. Firefighter Nate Denio. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Congratulations. Well done. Firefighter Kyle Jameson. Congratulations. Thank you. Congratulations. <laughs> Firefighter Jason Newman. Congratulations. Good job. Great job. Good job. And three members that couldn't be here tonight are uh, Buck Frost, Gregory Smushkin, and Donald Tebow. Congratulations. How's that? And item B is my <laughs> monthly report or quarterly report. <clears throat> I have given you, uh, as requested in the past, some copies of some statistical information. Uh, those both documents represent year-to-date information so that um, you have it to refer back to if you'd like at some point. Um, there haven't really been any major significant fires 
yet this year. Um, I have provided you a copy of our report from our incident management software. 2014 year to date, we have had three residential fires, eight total fires within structures, an additional 19 within vehicles or areas adjacent to buildings. As you look through those reports, you can see dollar value of property lost in the uh, incident locations. Those are merely estimates that are completed at the time of the incident based on the officer's assessment of uh, damage. The breakdown by district is 48% in the beach district, 44% in the town district, 8% in the rural district. Again, that's that area that um, is not serviced by hydrants, the southernmost part of Route 1 and the far western part of town, for a total of 1,167 fire incident responses. Year to date, all right, I'm sorry, year to July end, we respond to 1,406 medical emergencies. That's an increase of 152 for the same period in time in 2013. Represents an increase of 12% from 2013. Along with that, year to date, we've had 232 occasions of simultaneous EMS calls. Most are two incidents, some are three incidents occurring at the same time. Um, there is a sheet that I've given to you that has a graph on it that shows those yeah. numbers on a monthly basis mm -hmm. along with that total for the year. And then as uh, each month passes, I continue to populate that uh, spreadsheet. That represents an increase of 28% over last year. This is the highest we've seen for this type of multiple call. Well, generally we do well managing these with our own resources. When we do not have an ambulance immediately available, we do rely on mutual aid. Um, over the course of the year, our requests and responses to or from other communities evens out. Certainly does drive the cost of ambulance coverage. As you know, each time a patient is transported, we have to call back people to staff the, uh, the next out the door ambulance. Um, you will also see that increase reflected in the EMS revolving fund line callback. So as you're reviewing those budgets and looking at those numbers and wondering why there is an increase, it is because of the volume of calls that we are responding to. The replacement ambulance is in service following a lengthy replacement process. I don't want to have to repeat that process anytime soon, that's for certain. <laughs> Um, though previously approved by the board, the next replacement was deferred to a later time, and that's uh, because the fund balance, the EMS fund balance, was a little bit lower than desired. So as that uh, uh, begins to stabilize and we are confident that there's enough money in there, we'll be coming back looking to replace the next ambulance. We have had many calls for extremely sick patients. Beginning in mid-May, we had a significant trauma call for a motorcycle accident that nearly amputated the rider's leg. Another significant trauma call occurred on Ocean Boulevard with two women sustaining serious injuries requiring extensive hospitalization and ongoing therapy. Also, a water rescue through the surf of a hypothermic autistic child challenged our rescuers. Three cardiac arrest saves that have all left the hospital and are doing well. The American Heart Association and the CDC both report that out of hospital cardiac arrest to actual discharge where people actually have some quality of life afterwards is only nine and a half percent. So having three cardiac arrests that were discharged and are all doing well out of the hospital in the last 60 days or so is uh, pretty significant. It's, a, it's apparent that the rate for successful discharge is considerably higher in Hampton, thankfully due to a number of factors, one being early CPR. We do a lot of CPR training for people in the community. In fact, we offer it free of charge to anyone who's interested, as long as they live or work within the town of Hampton. Um, early defibrillation. Over the last 10 years, there have been a number of defibrillators placed in locations to give the public access to those. In fact, there's one in this room located on the wall right there. Mm -hmm. And the last is the rapid provision of advanced pre-hospital care, our paramedics. Without having the paramedics to stabilize getting their heart beating again, saving their heart muscle, saving their brain, people survived to discharge. In fact, it was all of these factors that earned Hampton the designation as the first heart safe community in New Hampshire. We've also had several heart attack calls, not cardiac arrest, but um, we call them STEMIs, ST elevation myocardial infarctions, that have been treated and delivered to the cath lab swiftly with successful outcomes. 
One patient presented in a life-threatening tachycardia with a pulse and received a timely cardioversion. That's where we actually deliver an electric shock. Like a defibrillation, only the patient is still conscious during this cardioversion and converted them into a normal, slower rhythm. They were then transported for definitive care at the hospital. Um, monthly education, including run reviews, continue to be a success with an average of about 21 of our members attending. Our review process is evolving and some exciting changes are planned for September. The education portion will become a monthly series with <coughs> guest educators attending each of our sessions. Beginning this year, we implemented under Deputy Ayotte's direction a quality continuous, I'm sorry, a continuous quality improvement program to improve our EMS system. Currently, the CQI committee review about 10% of all calls. All calls reviewed are based on the same criteria set. Those would be advanced airway insertions, cardiac arrest, cardiac chest pain, respiratory emergencies, stroke, trauma, pediatric, and OB patients. Uh, we did add a new category mid-spring for all mutual aid calls. Reviews are completed to evaluate documentation, adherence to treatment protocols, and assessments as example. The CQI committee is currently working to assess the changes that have occurred since the beginning of the program. We are performing a comparative analysis of patient care reports from January to July to determine the effect of the review, education, and changes implemented since the program's inception. We're working diligently to improve all aspects of patient care. We're working to build on our relationships with our local hospitals, work in collaboration to improve education. Anecdotally, I would say that it's probably one of the best programs we've put in place in the last 10 years. Um, without having measured it yet, it's something they're working on now, uh, it shows that it is working. The feedback that we get from the hospital, the feedback that we got from Dr. Wharton, who's one of the chief cardiologists at Exeter Hospital, the feedback that we're getting from the medical directors at both the Exeter and the Portsmouth Hospital, and the EMS coordinators at both the Exeter and Portsmouth Hospital show that this is definitely working. And what we want to do is improve our service and provide the best level of care that we can for our citizens and visitors. On to vehicles, all of our pump testing has been completed. Uh, the ADA E1, engine four, it's our oldest of our pumpers, had to be coaxed along a little to reach passing capacity. The two Smeal pumpers, due to age, remember they're now just over 10 years old, 12, 13 years, experienced some cooling problems and are in need of uh, rather costly radiator replacements. One has been completed with the other hopefully planned for later this year. Buildings, we're approaching the one year anniversary of the station completion. I'm very happy to report that we've had no major problems. Most have been warranty items with only one leak that is in process of being repaired. With personnel, we've been able to maintain our minimum staffing this year and not reduce daily staffing as we have had to do in previous years to accommodate limitations of funding. However, with some extended absences due to injury, I'm cautiously optimistic regarding how we will conclude 2014. Um, I believe when I was here in May, I had reported on a number of extended absences. Uh, two of those original absences continue. So they are definitely long-term absences. And that does affect our staffing. It does affect what it cost us to deliver service. One is a sick leave due to injury off-duty on March 2nd and uh, continues with several months of rehab re remaining. One is a workers' comp injury that is going to require surgery. It is scheduled. It will be done during September. I expect that there will probably be a 12-week minimum absence. One is a sick leave due to a necessary surgery also with an anticipated 12-week minimum absence. These absences do affect the, the coverage cost expended year to date as well as through the rest of the year. In addition to the unfilled fire inspector, the secretary in fire prevention resigned to accept a position offering benefits. I've not yet filled the secretary's position to save the funds in the event the board chooses to fill the inspector position later this year. Uh, in addition to the letters of merit that I presented, I mentioned that there was another incident uh, in, in May of 2013. There was an incident that occurred out on the jetty where several people had be, been swept into the water. Hampton police had assisted, Hampton firefighters had assisted 
Um, those members will be recognized in September at the New Hampshire Fire Service Committee of Merit Ceremony in Concord. Also, Captain Justin Cutting has successfully completed the process that awards him the professional designation of fire officer. The Commission on Professional Credentialing met on May 6, 2014 to officially confer the redesignation upon Captain Cutting. Justin is one of only 199 fire officers worldwide to receive this designation. The Commission on Professional Credentialing awards the fire officer designation only after an individual successfully meets all of the organization's stringent criteria. The process includes an assessment of the applicant's education, experience, professional development, technical competencies, contributions to the profession, and community involvement. In addition, all applicants are required to identify a future professional development plan. The fire officer program uses a comprehensive peer review model to evaluate candidates seeking, seeking the credential. Justin's actually been a member for 17 years of the Hampton Fire Department. And that concludes all the information I have for this evening. Questions? Thank you, Chief. Second one. First of all, I would like to see a letter of congratulations from this board to Captain Cunning. I think that's only fitting. Um, I <coughs> am happy as one member of this board and Rusty as well, I think uh, all of us, to communicate to the public the c letters of commendation that we receive as uh, incidents occur and our first responders are, are responding. Staffing, staffing, <coughs> staffing. The primary comment I get from the public regarding fire and the the EMS has has taken over a large share of your responsibilities. I go way back with your department. Uh, Mike Brillard, of course, is, is back there too and he can relate to that. And good evening, Deputy Ayotte. Um, and I can attest he does go way back. Well, the the EMS function has ballooned since you came on board as our first uh, uh, well, whatever, EMA, uh, paramedic. Paramedic, thank you. Uh, I'm concerned about staffing because what the public mostly communicates to me is <coughs> when they have an emergency, when, is some, when something is wrong, it's all well and good to have uh, backup from other communities, but they want their crew, and frankly the same as I do, they want the Hampton medics, the Hampton firefighters, the Hampton Ambulance coming to their home. And I am concerned about the lack of personnel to, to staff when you have the vacations, when you have the sick time, when you have the uh, people uh, with uh, long-standing injuries. You know, you, we haven't even really, we're, we're running the ambulances from Winnicott Road. And as one member of this board, I am going to continue to make a pain in the neck of myself and try to get to advocate for more staffing for you and more positions for you because this is a big operation. This is a terribly important feature for this community. And you have got to have the personnel that you need to operate that department successfully. And if you need to put out two or three ambulances at a time, you, you, you're going to have to have the people to do it. You have the, you have the machines, you have the vehicles, you have the equipment, you have the housing now, and none of it is any good without the people to do the job. I, I was a little concerned last time uh, when we had the um, Christy Pulliam in talking about the EMS fund balance because for the first time we're seeing a chargeback in there for the people who aren't paying the bills. The write-offs. Write-off. Uh, people who aren't paying the bills and I guess we'll see a smaller number in the future because there will be individuals who won't be paying but I'm I'm concerned about that that was designed to be self-funding but uh, if there are ways and I don't I don't know what they are but if there are ways to try to maybe achieve uh, a a little more up-to-date figure each month and B to try to see that we can get paid that would be that would be very nice. Uh, I I want to see your department grow 
to service the community, we have far more residents now than we had just when you came on board. I asked uh, Ed Tinker, our assessor, about four or five years ago if he could give me a printout of the number of condominiums in town. It was about 2,400. I asked him another for another request about a month ago, and 3,000 <coughs> condominiums alone, commercial and retail and residential. We have ballooned as a population. And you have these nice gentlemen sitting here, but they are being handcuffed, I think, by not having enough personnel. So I'm going to continue to make a pain in the neck of myself, and I'll say it publicly, and I'll say it to the board, I'll say it to the public, and I'll say it to the department. We need more manpower because it's only the men and women of your department who get the job done. If I could very quickly respond to three points that Mrs. Wolsey made. Um, to relate to the EMS fund and the rates and the collections. The rates are set at a mm -hmm. very appropriate level. I've looked at rates yep. across the New England region and um, I'm reluctant to increase our rates in an effort to try and collect more revenue because I want to I want to set them at a rate that I think is fair mm -hmm. to everyone. The collection is very good for a service. Um, it would be nice if we could always collect 100%, but it's just not possible. I mean, there are, mm -hmm. there are too many visitors that come from out of the country, from out of the state, that it's just, in, you know, uninsured folks, that it's just very difficult to collect. Um, so unfortunately, we'll never get to 100%. I think what you will see now, and it was, it was probably a good call on the part of the auditors, rather than allowing some of that debt to accumulate over a longer period of yeah. time, write it off in smaller yeah. amounts. So that's all going to be done. And you will see those monthly reports. Mm -hmm. um, we now never fall behind more than maybe two weeks in processing reports. Um, and it, that really is representative of the time of year. You know, it's July and August when the number of ambulance calls doubles or triples. Oh, yeah. It takes a little bit longer to process those. Yeah. But um, by the end of the year, we have closed out 100% of the reports. Mm -hmm. And the last item was helping stabilize the staffing. I totally agree. And it's always been part of my long-range plan to deal with our equipment and our apparatus, deal with our structures and our facilities, and then stabilize our staffing. The 2014 proposed budget had some increases to help stabilize that. But unfortunately, as we know, we're on a default budget. So we're still operating on a two-year-old budget. You know. We uh, have put forth a respectable budget for 2015 mm -hmm. that does include some increases to help stabilize some of those staffing issues. Not yet add people, but let's go in the right direction, stabilize, and hopefully with, a, with an approved budget in 2015, we can at least maintain what we, what we have. I want to do a quick follow-up on that, though. The, the Four firefighter positions, the entry-level positions were let go in 2005 because of that default budget because somebody got their backsides up. And the budget committee lobbied and lobbied and finally restored those positions. You're still back where you were in 2005 and you were short then. That's my only comment. We cannot continue to run this department with the amount of service that it's expected to provide short staffed. Selectman Griffin. Um, <coughs> Excuse me. Um, Mr. Welch, sure. uh, last time I was checking about the population of Hampton it had gone down. It was down a thousand a thousand people the last believe I believe with the last census. I just wanted <coughs> to establish if that trend is still happening. We are we are under fifteen thousand officially. Yeah, because we used to consider it was 17,000. So actually, the population is down. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to establish that. Um, and I appreciate your report and all the good work that you did. This is another interesting letter here. Uh, the weekend after the 4th of July, my daughter-in-law brought me to the fire department and to have my eye looked at for treatment. The firefighters rinsed my eyes out over a sink the rinse helped tremendously, and I didn't need to go to the hospital. I also used the bottle of eye rinse when I returned to the cottage. It also helped. Thank you, fire 
Hampton Beach Firefighters. And I think this is a wonderful letter. And I think I'm reading it mainly so that people that might have something like that happen, that they would feel comfortable to go there. And um, <clears throat> I, I think you do a great job. It's always been my personal favorite part of the fire department is the uh, ambulance service that you, and all of the wonderful things that I see you do constantly. And uh, I think that it really helps uh, make people feel good in many ways and helps give you support for the fire department, which I certainly am supportive of your good efforts mm -hmm. and all of these things these gentlemen have done here tonight. Um, <clears throat> I think that with some, uh, I know the last time I looked at some of those uh, uh, uncollected ambulance things, I, I know that some of the people were dead. So I think that there, every so often, you're going to find that there's people mm -hmm. that are no longer here that are even were being carried on for, you know, several years. So I think it's good that you're cleaning them out, and um, I'm anxious to hear your both of your uh, uh, when we start talking about the staff about what you think that we need to do. Thank you. So, gentlemen, I think. Um, uh, as always, the Hampton Fire Department does a great job. Um, you have uh, <coughs> you have a lot of good equipment, but you also have some aging equipment, and uh, that's one of my concerns. Is that we need to make sure the public realizes that when you talk about the old E1, the 88 E1 that needs to be replaced, uh, when you talk about the Schmiels getting 10 years old and now they're getting into the middle span of their life. Uh, we always have to be cognizant of that to figure out what we're going to do about replacing those. And we're going to make sure that we do replace them because you know as I do the, the ISO rating, and I'm sure that's coming up fairly soon. I Actually, believe. we just received a letter from mm -hmm. them last week. Did we? Yeah. Okay. Right. That, they're working on it now, or is that? Mm -hmm. so they, they don't do a full reevaluation. Periodically, they ask us to update some information. Okay. So, And I know that's all it does, deals with equipment, manpower. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, so we need to make sure that we have the correct manpower because it, for those people out there that don't know it, when your ISO rating goes down, you also, your insurance rates go up. So it's going to cost you one way or another. So I'd rather pay it in being proactive than, than, than reactive. So um, that's what the public needs to, needs to remember that because, you know, that truck may be shiny and all that, it's still 20-something, 20 25 years old. <coughs> it needs to be replaced, and, and we need to do that. So, uh, excellent report, and uh, I'm looking forward as we go into the budget s season to see how we can do it so we can make sure that the manpower is there. Uh, we, we work at that. Good. Thank you. Excellent report. Congratulations. And, you know, your administration does a great job. I think the frontline guys do a <laughs> phenomenal job, and that's what makes everybody look good. And it's really proud to be from Hampton uh, with such a fine department. And I agree with the staffing and stuff, and it has to be looked at in the budget process and hopefully educate and, and do what we need to do. Okay. So congratulations. Thank you. Chief, gentlemen, and family members, I wanted to uh, just say, uh, uh, forgoing any demographics or uh, business practices on a night like tonight when you're actually saving lives. And uh, you're not alone in doing that. Our, our public works will follow you and their contributions in terms of our uh, infrastructure, in terms of our way of life, the police department, you guys are top shelf. It's a wonderful integration of the taxpayer, the leadership, and uh, you folks that execute. But uh, in terms of uh, firefighter families and, and employees that are working for public works and police, the town knows full well that it takes a family to serve. And there's children at home, there's uh, callbacks, and uh, I see some family members out there perhaps tonight. And uh, thank you to them as well, and thank you for your brief. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good evening. And, and make sure you look at all those empty condominiums. <laughs> it's good to see Group 1 here, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> From and forward, number two, Keith Noyes, Director of the Department of Public Works, quarterly report with Assistant Public Works Director Chris Jacobs. Gentlemen. Good evening. Uh, I've provided you all with a detailed report, yep. a department update for the second quarter. As you can see from the report, we've had another busy three months. Uh, unfortunately, we're saddened by the loss of one of our employees, uh, Dan McCarran, who drove one of our solid waste collection trucks 
um, that affected the, the department as a whole. Uh, I think all department public works um, employees welcome spring after a long and busy winter season performing snow fighting operations. Uh, this spring we had a considerable amount of work following up from that uh, tough winter performing storm damage and equipment repairs. Uh, major projects that I worked on included the uh, Hampton Beach infiltration and inflow study that was uh, performed by Underwood engineers. They have completed that study in draft form. Uh, Chris and I have, our department has reviewed it. Uh, they're actually preparing an executive summary uh, for the Board of Selectmen to, to have, and I should have that within the next couple of weeks. And then we'll be preparing a presentation, a brief presentation from Underwood Engineers on the results of that project. Uh, no real surprises. We expected there'd be a considerable, considerable amount of infiltration and flow uh, found in the testing, and sure enough, it did, it did show um, what our concerns were and that there is more than acceptable amount of that infiltration and inflow. Second project is the Exeter Road reconstruction uh, preliminary report. Preliminary report. Uh, again, CME Engineers has completed this project and is also prefer preparing an executive summary report for your, re for your review and will also be giving a project presentation at a future board meeting. Uh, both will be held in time for any decisions affecting next year budget or warrant articles. Um, we had a number of personnel changes during this quarter, which has given our employees an opportunity, some employees an, op an opportunity for advancement, and in some cases transfers to other divisions within the department. In addition, we have hired two new full-time employees from the outside job market, and those weren't additional employees, but they were to fill um, the employees that either had left or transferred to a different division. From a department budgetary standpoint, as of June 30th, we are in good shape. However, I am very mindful that we need to plan ahead for November and December, potential snow fighting and storm cost, and budget accordingly. And that's always a uh, difficult uh, thing for public works because the frustration that I find is we have money in the budget for certain projects now. But if we spend that money and then, God forbid, we get a tough November and December and we spend that money um, because of snow fighting, we can over, go over our budget. But if we withhold doing those projects and then we get lucky and we don't have um, any major snowstorms or you know, cost um, projects, then we end up not getting the projects done and having money left in our budget. So that's always a challenge in, in the public works world. It would be great if we were on a uh, fiscal year budget where we would be going from July 1st to June 30th and at the end of the, the, um, in the winter season we would then have, you know, the early spring to, to do some of those projects if we have money left in the budget. Um, so um, I've asked Chris to come in. He's going to brief you on a couple of his projects that he's been doing. And then because I gave you like six pages of material there, I wanted to give you an opportunity to ask any questions that you may have on those projects there uh, so we can brief you on those. Mine was uh, more or less on the paperwork side. Um, it seems in this every spring we have a number of uh, reports that are due to, the, due to the state and to the EPA. One is a collection system maintenance report. They want to make sure that we're jetting and cleaning our sewer lines, that's an annual report, so always due late April or in May. And the other biggie is always that uh, MS4, which stands for uh, S Small Community Stormwater Management. Um, we are still in our, we are now in our seventh year on our five-year permit, uh, only because it's taken the EPA about two years to try and issue a new permit for all of us, meaning everybody in New Hampshire. Um, they received such a deep set of comments that uh, twice they've had to rewrite the whole permit. So, and my understanding is they're now on their second or third person attempting to rewrite the permit. So, um, thankfully, it's a give and take process. I like that, but um, it is a very difficult uh, process. Um, that's part of when you saw in the budget, like last year, I think we asked for 
15 and we trimmed it down to 35 um, it was based upon the anticipation was that they were going to release that permit um, the other permit that we're still holding on with bated breath is the we are also in the seventh year of our wastewater treatment plant permit um, one of the gentlemen who started writing that two years ago actually retired <laughs> and it's been <laughs> handed off to someone else um, my understanding is that the EPA writes the permit it goes up to Concord ten different people or approximately that many people weigh into it uh, mark it up in whatever comments they have it goes back <coughs> to the EPA and if everybody down there loves it then they'll finally yeah. release it but they're also trying to level the playing field ie get all the wastewater treatment plants uh, on, on the same footing um, so th that's where we stand respect with permitting ie we've we've done our part and we're still waiting for two permits from from uh, from them although it doesn't prevent our day-to-day -day operations As a matter of fact uh, just keeps us uh, in waiting anticipation and therefore uh, we do everything we can to be be ready for when they do come back and ask us um, the other uh, thing that we've been working on is uh, of course our ice pond dam and our uh, mill pond dam we still have a, an LOD uh, respect to the uh, mill pond dam part of that is maintaining the water levels uh, to that effect uh, part of the residents that you said your residents count went down by a few people it also went down by five beavers this spring because of the for the same reason um, they were all uh, taken away from town I'll put it that way um, something that has to be done otherwise uh, the water level behind the dam gets too high and I yeah. get uh, we'd all get in trouble with uh, DES for um, a impounding water and uh, creating a potentially hazardous situation uh, the other thing that we were working on uh, through the spring is of course the downtown drainage study I think all of you um, got Keith's memo of July 11th um, we did open up bids on June 10th but they were well in excess of um, the monies that we did have appropriated one of them was 398,000 or 399 you throw them a 20 spot and 478 thousand dollars well in excess of what was um, anticipated uh, part of the the reason is it's not so much the per foot cost it's the location of the job yeah um, the a number of the contractors were even though we gave them a lengthy it's about 30 days worth of work and we gave them a 60 day window to get it done um, they carried healthy amounts for um, basically mobilization or not having the room to work right. having to do things um, in other words uh, instead of being able to pile a, uh, a whole pile of crushed stone right in the middle of the intersection to help bed the <laughs> pipe as they're going down through they have to put it in what they call a uh, stone bin yeah. which is a rather large box that they drag down the street um, it's possible but it just costs a lot more money that way to do it so um, I think that's what was reflective of the prices um, we even asked if they wanted to do it at night would that help um, but uh, obviously it, it did not so part of the money has been put forth uh, it basically um, we are asking for a uh, one-year extension and I believe that'll take us from uh, the money was due to expire March 15 it'll take it out to March 16 so in case we the, the all the work is still there I mean the the value of the engineering is still there it can always be rebid it can always be attached to another project we can see what happens uh, with respect to the Exeter Road project this spring it could be piggybacked on that that's well equipment wise we uh, in March people did give us uh, uh, three brand new pieces of equipment the street sweeper was delivered it was put on in service within three days of delivery uh, this one is a lot nicer than the one that we had thank you um, when it comes to cleaning it out it actually has a fire hose attachment to the back side you literally attach that and turn it on and everything and I do mean everything comes out of the inside before we get sand and some salt deposits in the corner which could corroded the thing out not with this we, we flush it out daily well every time we use it we flush it out 
then it's allowed to air dry. Um, the pay, payloader, the, it's a CAT 924, for those people at home that really want to know what size it is, um, it did get delivered. We went through it um, from one end to the other. We found a number of pieces on it that looked like they were already corroded. Oh. And so we basically sent the piece of equipment back and they have it. They're replacing every part on it that was corroded. Basically like aluminum fittings uh, uh. for the uh, inside the engine compartment going from the radiator back to the engine, etc. It looked like it had been sitting out on the beach for a month before we got it, although it hadn't been. So anyhow, we, we basically went through it because we feel that we need, the taxpayers are paying top dollar for something. We need to get top dollar. Uh, they've picked it up. They have it. They were fixing it at their cost. And we have a rental one that we're using right now. So it isn't like we didn't get what we paid for. We we're actually running a piece of equipment right now. We're using it to turn the compost pile and do other things with it. So it doesn't hinder us at all. And the backhoe um, is going to be delivered, they said last week, but it could be by Friday this week or next week. That it's, so it's in route. So that's uh, the status of our equipment. Just following up briefly on the equipment, so following up on a <coughs> uh, comment made about the fire department equipment and the importance of having good equipment. If you remember when I was working for the city of Portsmouth, I applied for a job for a public works director for community up north, and I went for an interview, and at the end of the interview, they asked the standard question, do you have any questions for us? And I said, yeah. I said, if I was to get this job, do you provide a town vehicle for the public works director to use? And the mayor says, yeah, if you can get it inspected, you can use it. <laughs> That's a true story. And it reminds me of the importance of having good equipment for all the departments, whether it's police, fire, or public works, that that's the tools that our people need to get their jobs done effectively. It affects morale, affects productivity, and ultimately affects cost. And unfortunately for us, and it's with the fire department, maybe not so much with the police department, but you're talking about equipment that's running anywhere from 300 to 500, six, I don't know what a fire truck runs, but it's probably around five or $600,000. Mm -hmm. You know, so we're going to be looking at, you know, and I know I'm getting ahead of myself, we're not in the budget season, but I am putting in four equipment replacement for this year, a conservative amount, but I am hoping that we do continue the, uh, the uh, momentum of getting the approval and the support from the community to our, replace our equipment because in order to, uh, for us to do our jobs effectively, our guides need needs the, the right good and quality tools that they, um, that they deserve to, to do the job with. So with that, open it up to any questions or discussions you may have. Selectman Uh to focus on Keith's most recent comment, um, you know I get excited about rolling stock, and I'm looking forward to reviewing that with you guys. Uh, are you exploring possibilities of somewhat reducing, for example, the number of pickups, et cetera, and focusing on getting the uh, larger vehicles to do the plowing so that we're not doing as much? I, you probably need some of the pickups for the side streets, but Absolutely. Are we, we're fococusing on the bigger heavy-duty vehicles so that we can actually get the streets plowed without piddling around in pickup trucks. We've set, and I've shared it with, I think, all of you, a 2014 goals, and mm -hmm. we've listed out all our goals individually, and then who's the primary responsible person for that goal and also who the supporting person is. And I think, I can't remember, I think there's 10 or 12 of them I have it here. But one of those goals is to, uh, and Chris has taken on the ultimate responsibility, to look at all our snow fighting equipment. And this past year, what we did was we got GPS units, we put them in the trucks uh, over the snow plow routes, and we were yeah. tracking them by computer to see how long the plow routes were taken to, to do. So we're trying to balance out the plow routes, but also as part of that is to look what's more effective. Does it make sense to have one three quarter ton or one ton, a one ton truck right. doing a job rather than a small pickup truck? Right. So we are definitely looking at that and making that a top priority to, to, to explore. And another, another component of that is the ability to shelter the vehicles in some reasonable manner because they're all sitting out there. The little Kodiaks are all sitting out there. They're all sitting out there exposed to the elements and the ability to wash them down. Uh, and that wash, are we right. still thinking about that wash down shed? I mean, it, 
you've got a ton of expensive equipment there sitting there rusting. I mean, Chris is just talking about rusting on the new right. the new guy. And and I know, I know it's hard to get, but I think we need an explanation both to this board, to the budget committee, and to the public on what you have to go through to get vehicles washed and where you're, where are you doing it on site and the EPA problems and so forth because we've got a lot of money into that equipment and it needs to be cleaned. Right. And you can take the police cruisers through the local car wash. Mm -hmm. But you can't do that with something. And I hope someday you're going to get rid of that freight liner, but I'm not going to go there right now. Well, if I may just follow up on that one particular item, because it's, you're going to hear about it sooner than later, is that I have presented to the town manager requests as part of our operating budget to have in 2015 a look at a public works master plan that will be three-pronged approach. It will be looking at buildings, vehicles, um, buildings, vehicles, and manpower because all three of them go hand in hand. Yes. And looking at and integrating that all, and I've put $30,000 in the budget to help, <coughs> we would do it as a team, but we would look at an engineering facilitator from uh, mm -hmm. experience in this to help us pull that together yeah. so we can have a long, like a five-year plan mm -hmm. on manpower, equipment, and buildings, and all of them do go hand in hand. And hope that this follow through on it, because that's critical. You can have all the plans in the world. And if this board and the budget committee won't follow through with some of that stuff, we're going to be dead in the water like we are now. I'm very disappointed in the uh, turn down on the grant for that culvert. Uh, that's, that's critical to that area, to that high street area. And they're going to keep flooding and flooding and flooding unless we can get going on that. Um, if you want a forecast for the winter, you can get the old farmer's almanac. I think it's going to come out pretty soon, <laughs> and that might help you in your planning. Uh, you, there's still a huge amount to be done, and I know the crews are working hard. The shoulders have got to be done. What's going on in Mace Road? What's that, what's that project going on? We did do a sewer, the size. sewer line repair uh, on Mace, um, just up from the Five Corners intersection. Yes. Yeah, yeah. That was a sewer line repair. Okay. And Mason Thompson, and I've mentioned it, I, I believe I mentioned it to, to Keith anyway, that is the worst dip going in, getting off Mace onto Thompson Road. I know there have been dig outs there for the sewer and all that stuff, but sometime or another, maybe could we get a little smoother entry yeah. in there. Furniture disposal, you kind of holding off, I know you had a little try at that, but it wasn't quite working economically. Are we th still thinking of that for EcoMain when we when we get on board there next year? Well, I just <coughs> talked to the town manager today. We're talking about the bidding of the uh, recycling and all the services for next year. And I told, suggested to him that we hold off until about November or December right. that we'd have a bid opening prior to uh, Christmas so that we'd have any, any changes we want to make would have in time for the deliberative session. Yeah. So we haven't forgot about that. We're looking at thinking the furniture disposal separately for We're looking at everything with a clean slate on how we do business across okay. the board with uh, solid waste and recycling management. Is it helping you now that that debris from the beach raking is no longer on site? Mm-hmm. Okay. And Chris was working on designs or, or whatever for the, what more sanit more aeration tanks and so forth. I know you were working on mapping the whole public works area. And by the way, that pile is going down for, as Fred said it would. The uh, the the grindings uh, down. Well, it's good though. It's but good. we're using it. That's good. But I, you're still working on that plan for the whole public works. Matter of fact, Keith and I walked the site the whole site a week ago. Good. And with, with that in mind. Good. Okay. And the transfer station, and I want to do a hats off to the members of your department who, f who staff the transfer station. They see me a lot, <laughs> and they're always nice to me, and you have really nice people there. And that is an incredible service to the town. It really is wonderful. And they've got everything blocked off. The aluminum now is all blocked off in this little cubby hole. But I really appreciate, A, the ability to go there, and B, you have such nice personnel working there. I appreciate that. And, and we get a lot, I get a lot of comments from residents in town mm -hmm. that are very impressed with mm -hmm. the reception they get from our employees. And that's one thing that Chris and I have tried to lead by example on. 
you know, treating our employees, uh, employees, our residents with attention. Mm -hmm. And you know, three quarters of the time, I can't give them what they want. They ask me for something, but they say, you know what, Mr. Noyce, thank you. I understand where you're coming from. Thank you just for coming out and hearing me out. Yeah. And that's what we do. So I try to, we try to get that across to all our employees, yeah. and it's working. And, and I think we have a great rapport with most of the community. You're going to have a few people that no matter what you do, they're not right. happy. But in this town, are very few at this point, I think. But it's really impressive. And the transfer station is high on my, high on my hit parade. So it's I really, good to hear. I'll pass that really love it. There. Selectman Griffin. Um, <clears throat> thank you for your report. Um, one thing I wanted to ask you is what is the status um, when you've studied in the past about the five corners um, doing something <laughs> different there? What is the status? <laughs> what, we, were th what were the last studies? We, we had a preliminary design done back my first year, I th so it must have been 2012. That was done. We have a preliminary plan. We have estimates and we have a number of options. It's like three options of what to do, three or four options of what to do. And it's kind of, it's still in the CIP for down the road, but really at this point I'm just waiting from an interest from the Board of Selectmen if they want to res resurrect it. It's, it's there. It's ready to go.